full screen here. What did we do? Good afternoon, and welcome to the inaugural lecture for the Jack Kogan Integrative Medicine Grand Rounds Act Annual Seminar Series. My name is Peter Wayne, and I serve as the director for the Osher Center, which is jointly based at Brigham and Women's Hospital and Harvard Medical School. As this is our very first presentation in this series, I wanna begin our program today by sharing a little bit of background on Jack Kogan's remarkable life and how his love of health and remaining physically active into his later years led him to the Osher Center and its various integrative therapies. I'll then pass on the virtual podium over to Mr. Kogan's wife, Mary Cornell, who will add some additional comments about Jack and share the motivation behind her very generous gift to the OSHA Center to support this lecture series. Finally, before introducing our main speaker for today, Dr. Aimin Lee, two other OSHA Center clinical providers who had the privilege of working closely with Jack, Ms. Jane Moss and Mr. Arthur Medor, will elaborate on what we all experience, namely that Jack had a gift of teaching and inspiring all who crossed his path, even when he was the student or the patient. So I first met Jack in 2015 when the Kogan family friend reached out to ask me if I would teach him Tai Chi. I was told he's in his later 80s, has some neurological um, conditions, um, but still jogs daily and is likely to show up at your studio on his own. Right from our first session, I was deeply touched by his curiosity, commitment, and almost childlike zeal for learning how to improve his balance and mobility. He was a fast learner, diligently followed instructions, and asked the probing questions all teachers love. Jack was one of the most humble, understated individuals I've had the privilege to work with. At no point during our sessions did Jack mention any of his remarkable professional achievements or his many contributions to the arts or other social causes. As an academic who struggles with finding work-life balance, I personally became intrigued with how he managed to accomplish so much and still find time for his passions of exercise and the arts. A partial answer to this was found in an address um, that I found on the internet that he gave to aspiring lawyers at the Harvard Law School in 2010, in which he said, if you're a natural, and this is a quote, if you're a natural workaholic, which I am, genetically, I guess, you must be careful not to be so drawn into your professional life that there's little time for anything else. It's as if you were in a giant centrifuge. You have to constantly avoid being drawn into the center and swim to the edge to reach the other activities that enrich your life. Exercise was clearly one of the things that enriched Jack's life. And it's for that reason, Mary Cornell and I thought physical activity and healthy aging would be the per perfect focus for this endowed lecture series. I'm now delighted to pass the virtual podium over to Jack's wife, Mary Cornell, who wished to share some of her own personal comments. Thank you, Peter. I'll take a moment or two to introduce my husband, John F. Kogan Jr., Jack, who was born in Boston in 1926 and lived in the metropolitan area all of his 93 years. He always said he wore two hats. One is a lawyer, former chairman and managing partner at Hale and Door, now Wilmer Hale, and one in the financial services industry for some 50 consecutive years, retiring as trustee emeritus of the Pioneer Funds and chairman emeritus of its management company. He was also on the boards of many civic and charitable organizations in this community and beyond, including to name just two, the Boston Symphony Orchestra and the Museum of Fine Arts Boston. All of these resulted in extensive travel at home and abroad, some of which I was fortunate enough to share with him in addition to many memorable vacations that we had. Thus, I know that where, wherever Jack went, he would immediately explore where and how he could include a run or a workout into his schedule. Jack always understood the importance of exercise and his lifelong passion for running started on a cross country team in high school in Melrose, 
when health challenges began making it more difficult for him to continue his running routine and medications were not able to compensate. He began looking at how integrative therapies offered by the Osher Center might help him. Therapeutic massage and Tai Chi both contributed to Jack's balance, patience, and better understanding of how to deal with the limitations of his neurological disease. I drove him to many of his appointments at Osher, and I saw firsthand the difference they made, both physically and mentally. I too have now begun seeking those benefits at the Osher Center. My beloved Jack lost his battle in January of 2020, and I wanted to honor him <laughs> and show our appreciation for the mind-body gifts he had received from the OSHA Center by establishing this ground grant, a Grand Brown's Lecture Series in his name. Thank you. Mary, thank you for those touching words and for helping us launch this event. Uh, and of course, for your belief and support in the Osher Center. I'd now like to introduce my dear friend and longtime Tai Chi colleague, Ms. Jane Moss. After it became clear that Jack was wholeheartedly committed to learning Tai Chi and wished to do regular um, private lessons, I thought it best to introduce him to Jane, who's one of the best teachers in town. As you will hear, they hit it off swimmingly. She will then introduce and set up a short video clip from one of our very gifted manual and movement therapists based at our clinic, Arthur Madour, who could not join us in person today, fittingly, because he's running an Ironman race at his youthful age of 72. <laughs> Jane? Thank you, Peter. When I think of Jack Kogan, I think of his great capacity to share his journey, inspiring us as much as hopefully we helped and inspired him. And it makes me smile. <laughs> Jack's Tai Chi journey began each week with a deep dive into every new Tai Chi movement, weight shift, gesture of hand or foot. These he quickly integrated into a rhythm and overall body sense. Where do you feel the movement, I often asked. And once he answered, it's light right here. And he gestured up and down his midline, his core and his smile just beamed. This full bodied approach gave rise to stories of childhood tree climbing in Melrose. I believe there were moments of spying on passersby to accounts of daily runs over decades in the changing seasons and light along the Charles River, and once in a while to a recitation of an entire Shakespeare sonnet. Jack's journey was not only about the challenges he faced, it was a journey from history, art, and music to family so dear to him, to the light in the core of the body. And these were the things he shared. And as for the challenges, I remember Jack's eagerness to show me how a Tai Chi principle helped him mobilize a temporarily frozen step or to change directions around a corner or simply to catch the flow in walking. And then we might speak of Fred Astaire. <laughs> but when we explored two-person Tai Chi, I was really touched by how that core lit up even more Clearly Jack took cues from the inside, the sense of weight shift and pouring, but also from the outside world as a Tai Chi push from a partner could inspire him to sit up or stand up straighter, ever relishing what came his way. What a legacy. I pass these insights on to my elder students, my community classes, to anyone interested in how, when you encounter a challenge, you can find right there, the energy to meet it full on, whole body with light and life. <laughs> <laughs>
I'd now like to introduce my colleague at the Osher Clinical Center, Arthur Medor. Arthur is a specialist in neuromuscular and Feldenkrais-based integrative movement therapy. Jack was always delighted to report what he had experienced with Arthur, especially how Arthur had found just the spot that needed to release. And that often uh, directed my work with Jack. Arthur could not be here in person because he's been busy running that Ironman race, but he shared a few comments with a video recording. Thank you, Jane, for that introduction. I know Jack and uh, enjoyed working with both you and me in uh, the last several years of his life. Peter Wayne first introduced me to Jack uh, several years ago. I think he was 89. And Jack was an avid runner and he came to me uh, partly because of Parkinson's had made it difficult for him to be upright and he was falling. And that makes uh, running somewhat difficult. So I would see him at the clinic, at the OSHA clinic. And we got to the stage where his passion for running matched my passion for running. And we took ourselves to a, a place that would be safe for him to run. And we went to a chiropractic office nearby his house. I'd pick him up and we'd uh, drive there and chat along the way. And I'd suit him into a, a treadmill that uh, has a, it's called an Alter G treadmill. And it has a bonnet that's over the, um, over the machine and you would hook your pants into, uh, into it, special um, uh, pants and it would inflate in a way that would allow, it would lift you up so that you could be anywhere from 20% of your body weight to 100% of your body weight. In this fashion, uh, anybody could run even if they could barely stand up. And so we, week after week, uh, we would go there and at his best, Jack got up to uh, an 11 minute mile for 20 seconds. And that's at a man who was about 92 at the time. We would also travel to the uh, Charles River where he told me he loved to run uh, <clears throat> in his younger years. And I used a gate belt for his safety, but we would jog along the Charles River and he got up to a quarter of a mile. And he enjoyed those, those runs immensely. And I remember him saying, wow, I can't wait to tell Mary, you know, how he did. And I think it was very rejuvenative, rejuvenating for him to do something that he had done uh, most of his life. He told me how important cross country running was for him uh, in uh, high school and how it got him into a nice crowd. And uh, I was just so pleased to be with him and pleased that uh, I was part of his life. It was an honor for me. I remember him so fondly. And uh, his memory certainly lives on in me. And I wish to thank Mary Keneal, his wife, for her generosity and sponsor this uh, Grand Rounds and for Peter Wayne for putting it all together. He does such a, a wonderful job doing these things. All right, I'll let you continue with their program. And uh, thanks for inviting me for my little talk. Well, thank you, Jane and Arthur, for your lovely words. Um, I now have the privilege of introducing our featured speaker, my colleague and friend, Dr. Ayman Lee. I cannot think of a better person to be the inaugural speaker for this event, as I'm in as a renowned world authority on the benefits of exercise and health. Dr. Lee received her medical degree from the National University of Singapore and her public health degrees from the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. 
Her primary research is in the role of physical activity for promoting health and well being. She's served on national and international expert panels developing physical activity guidelines, including, among many, the inaugural 2008 US Physical Activity Guidelines, the 2010 World Health Organization Global Recommendations for Physical Activity, and the 2013 AHA ACC um, Guidelines on Lifestyle Management to Reduce Cardiovascular Risk. She's the author of well over 500 peer-reviewed scientific articles, editor of two important textbooks on the epidemiology of exercise. And as you'll learn, practicing what she preaches, she obsessively monitors her step count daily. So without further ado, please join me in virtually welcoming Dr. Lee. Thank you, Peter. I'm going to start sharing my screen and hopefully you will be able to see that. So good afternoon, everyone. I'm just so honored and delighted to be joining you today for the inaugural Jack Kogan Lecture. I would like to add my thanks to Mary Corneal for being so generous in sponsoring this lecture series. And of course, thanks to the OSHA Center and to its director, Dr. Peter Wayne, for inviting me to speak today. I've titled my presentation today, Why Should I Bother Being Physically Active? Now, Prior to this period of time, I did not know Jack. So when Peter graciously invited me to speak at this lecture, I wanted to find out more about Jack's life. And in reading about Jack, I thought, gee, he should be the one answering this question. He would probably have spoken very eloquently and very passionately about this. I read that into his early 90s, he was still running along the Charles River. And I appreciated what he said. He said, I'm blessed beyond measure with good health, energy, and happiness. And I thought, hmm, running, good health, energy, and happiness, cause and effect. Now, of course, based on this single study, any epidemiologist worth a salt would know that you can't make this conclusion. But I hope at the end of this talk that I will convince you that there is a large body of evidence clearly supporting that physical activity has many physical and mental benefits and it's really good for our health. So I will formally start by saying that I have no conflicts to disclose. Let's begin with our case vignette. So I thought that for our case vignette, we'll talk about BE. She's a 59 year old white woman. She comes to your primary care practice for a checkup. She has not seen you in three years. She's been in decent health, and this visit was prompted by the death of her best friend from sudden cardiac death. B e is pretty healthy. She has a profile that is typical for a healthy person of her age. She's a non-smoker. Her body mass index puts her in the overweight range, which is not atypical for many people in this country. Her blood pressure is a little bit on the high side, her HbA1c is normal, her lipids are unremarkable, and her family history is unremarkable. Now, prior to the pandemic, she worked as an administrative assistant and traveled by car an hour to work and an hour back. Her kids last month gave her a Fitbit watch for her birthday. I'm not tied to Fitbit. It could be an Apple Watch, it could be a Garmin Watch, whatever, a wearable that monitors the physical activity. She does no exercise and sort of a little bit motivated by this Fitbit watch that her kids gave her. She wanted to know what she needs to do to stay healthy. So what do we tell her about physical activity? Now, in order to be able to give B a reasoned evidence-based answer, I thought we would review two, three topics. Now, I cannot advance my screen. Okay, great. So the three topics I thought we'd review in order to be able to give BE a reason to answer would be first, what do the data tell us about the relation between physical activity and health? And you will see that there's actually a very large body of evidence it's probably indisputable that physical activity is one of the best things you can do for your health. What we quibble a little bit more about is exactly what should you be doing 
So the second large topic I want us to look at is what are current guidelines for physical activity? What should we be doing? How much do we need? And unfortunately, you'll see that most people tend to ask, how little can I get away with? So that leads us to the third area, which is the area of current research to find out how little we actually need to do and yet still benefit. And I'll talk about some of the research in that area. So let's start. What do we know about physical activity and health? Now, the idea that physical activity is beneficial for our health is not a new idea. If you look at ancient writings, you'll find that ancient Chinese physicians, ancient physicians, Indian physicians believed in physical activity for their clients, their patients. And if you look at Greek writings, uh, ancient Greek physicians, philosophers wrote about physical activity for health. However, interestingly enough, in the late 1800s, in the early 1900s, people started believing that it was not healthy and that it was dangerous. So those of you who know about the famous boat races between Oxford and Cambridge that started becoming very popular in the 1800s, um, the young men in those days did a lot of rowing and the physician, English, physicians, English physicians at that time weren't very happy about it because they thought it was dangerous for their health. And if you look at the history of treatment of myocardial infarction, those of you who've read about Eugene Bronwell's writings uh, in the history of cardiology know that in the mid 1900s, physicians used to put their patients on bed rest for 30 days as a treatment for heart attack. But beginning in the mid 1900s, we started to see work from exercise physiologists, particularly those in Finland, and from physical activity epidemiologists looking at studies where they would follow physically active individuals for their health outcomes. And since that time, so for more than half a century now, we really have a large body of evidence showing physical activity to be beneficial for health. So Plato was not a physician, he was a philosopher, but it's interesting to see that he said, lack of activity destroys the good condition of every human being while movement and methodical physical activity save it and preserve it. And interestingly enough, he said movement. So just not being inactive. And we'll see that this is currently what we think, not necessarily formal exercise, but just any sort of movement is helpful for our health. I wanted to highlight the work of these two individuals, the, the pioneers of physical activity epidemiology, and I highlight them for a couple of reasons. So on the left, you see Jerry Morris from London, and on the right, Ralph Paffenbarger from the US. And I highlight these two individuals because Ralph Paffenbarger was my mentor, dragging me into the field of physical activity research. And also, he started the landmark Harvard Alumni Health Study, which is one of the earliest studies showing us that physical activity was associated or is associated with good health. And the Harvard Alumni Health Study enrolled as its subjects, Harvard men who had gone to Harvard University matriculating between the years of 1916 and 1950 or graduating between 1920 and 1954. And I know that Jack was in the class of 1949. So possibly he may have been one of the subjects of this study. <laughs> Since the days of these early studies, we now have an enormous body of literature clearly showing that physical activity is helpful for individuals throughout the lifespan. Now, various expert panels throughout the world, not just in the US, but also in the UK and the World Health Organization, have said that exercise is good for children and adolescents. And children and adolescents, it builds strong muscles and strong bones. It improves their fitness and their cardiovascular risk factors. It is associated with better weight trajectory. It reduces the risk of depression. Physical activity helps uh, cognitive function in children and adolescents, and this also results in better school performance. Now, in, ad in adults, we know that physical activity is associated with longer life, primarily because of reduced risk of many chronic diseases, such as cardiovascular disease, cancer. We also know that physical activity is associated with better physical functioning, better quality of life, such as better sleep, lower risk of anxiety and depression, uh, better cognitive function. It is also associated with 
lower risk of dementia. And specifically, in older adults, physical activity is related to less risk of frailty and less risk of falling, primarily because of better physical function. This led the editor of the British Medical Journal a couple of years to say that physical activity is indeed the miracle cure. What pill, what medicine can you think of that you can take that benefits so many conditions that I see you, I showed you on the previous slide? And what she said was, I'm paraphrasing what she's saying, she's saying that if anybody says that they have a miracle cure, you should look at it very suspiciously. But physical activity is one exception. Truly, there is a large body of evidence that backs up the assertion that physical activity is indeed a miracle cure. Now, I'd like to show you some of the data, but in the interest of time, we don't have time to look at every possible condition. What I want to do is focus on adults. And in the tip of the cap to Jack, I know Jack was a visionary. He expanded the work of his firms into international waters really early on. So in the tip of the cap to Jack, I wanted to focus on diseases that are important globally. So we tend to think of cardiovascular disease and cancer as diseases that are unique to the high income countries. But increasingly, we see that middle income and lower income countries also suffer from cardiovascular disease and cancer. And these are the leading causes of death nowadays in middle income countries. And it's particularly important for us when we look at middle income countries, because these countries are home to about three quarters of the world's population. So even if they do not rank as number one and number two, even if they rank say in the top five, they result in very many deaths because of large concentration of population in these countries. So what are the data showing us that physical activity is associated with longer life and decreased risk of chronic diseases? So this first slide shows data from a pooled analysis that a group of colleagues from the National Cancer Institute and I published some years ago. The lead author was Hannah Aram, she was at the National Institute of Cancer at that point in time. So what this study did was it pulled together data from six studies throughout the world, and these were large studies primarily US and Europe-based studies, looking at more than 600,000 individuals. Now, this study was published several years ago, and at that time, wearable devices was not that commonly used. So the state of the art for studies of physical activity would be to ask individuals to report on their physical activity. So in these studies, participants reported on their leisure time, physical activity, and what we did was we classified individuals according to the amount of these sheer time physical activity that they did. So on the x-axis, what we have is levels of participation in leisure time physical activity or moderate to vigorous intensity. And these are units of energy expenditure, but let's not worry about that. Basically, you can think of it as doing no leisure time physical activity or doing leisure time physical activity and amounts that corresponded to this level is not quite meeting recommendations. And we'll talk later on about what recommendations are. And then one to two times, three to five times and so forth, all the way up to 10 times what's recommended. And there are a couple of things I want you to know. The first thing is that, you know, you clearly see substantial reductions in death rate over the period of follow-up when you reach physical activity recommendations. But even before you reach recommendations, you see the death rate starting to go down. So I view this curve as sort of a sum is good, more is better, and it levels up after a point in time. So you see the curve upticks a little bit at 10 times physical activity recommendation. And it is true that there is some interest in whether there might be hazardous effects of extreme levels of physical activity. And when I say extreme levels, it's really, really high levels, not quite at the level that the general population might do. So this is 10 times physical activity recommendations. And even though you see this curve going up a little bit, there were very few individuals who participated at this level, less than 1% of the population did. And if you look at this dot and this dot, statistically, they're not that different. So to my mind, it's actually this curve goes down and it sort of levels off at this point. 
So what the second thing I also wanted to point out is if you meet recommendations for fiscal activity, you see about a 30% reduction in risk of mortality during follow-up. So this is relying on self-reported physical activity. This is a more recent study where you start seeing data from objective measures of physical activity. So wearables, so not relying on people to report that physical activity. So this is a meta-analysis that a group of individuals uh, internationally and I worked on and that we published a couple of years ago. The lead author is both Okulin from Norway and this eight studies, but the sample size is smaller. So device-based studies tend not to enroll as many participants as self-report physical activity, because you might imagine it's pretty expensive to run these kinds of studies. Nevertheless, there's a sizable number of participants in this study, uh, more than 36,000 individuals. And one of the studies in this meta-analysis is the women's health study that I work on with Julie Boring. You can see, again, the same sort of curve. Some is good, more is better. And again, you see it going a little bit up. But I would say that the levels here, the results are a little bit less precise because fewer people do these large amounts of physical activity. And you can see that the confidence interval is large. So some is good. You don't need to meet physical activity recommendations. And at physical activity recommendations, you see a 60% reduction in mortality rate. So why do I highlight these numbers? The reason I highlight these numbers is because I guess those of us working in the physical activity field has a little bit of a chip on our shoulders. We think of our field as being very important, but sometimes we think that we are given short shrift. And that if you look at people who work with treatment-based, um, the treatment-based paradigm, people think of those as being more important, but I wanted to compare and contrast this to you. So this is a slide that was a meta-analysis conducted a few years ago, published in the Lancet, looking at 123 randomized controlled trials, testing different types of medication for the reduction of systolic blood pressure. And this also was a large body of evidence, more than 600,000 participants in these 123 randomized controlled trials. And what they said was that if you reduce blood pressure by 10 millimeters of mercury for systolic blood pressure, you see a 13% risk reduction. And 10 millimeters of BP reduction for systolic blood pressure. It's not a small amount. It's a large reduction in systolic blood pressure. With every 10 milliliter reduction, you see a 13% risk reduction in mortality. And people in the clinical field think 13%, wow, that's really great. Well, in our physical activity field, meeting physical activity recommendations, which I'll show you later, is something that's very doable. You see a 30 to 60% reduction in risk of mortality. So a much larger risk reduction than taking antihypertensive pills. So I'm now going to turn to the two major causes of death worldwide. So these are data looking at physical activity and reduction in risk of cardiovascular disease. This is a study that came out earlier this year and the data are from the UK Biobank. Some of you may know that the UK Biobank is a national cohort study in the UK, kind of, I guess, analogous to the all of us study that we have in the US. The UK Biobank in this particular analysis made use of device-based measures of physical activity. So using device-based measures of physical activity, investigators classified participants, a large number of participants in this particular analysis, there were more than 90,000 participants. According to total volume, you can think of that as the total amount of physical activity that you do, or according to moderate or vigorous intensity physical activity, which is what is currently recommended. So these three different analyses classified individuals according to quarters of their total movement or their moderate intensity physical activity or vigorous intensity physical activity. And what you see is that the most active quarter compared to the least active quarter had more than a 50% reduction in risk of cardiovascular disease. Again, compare that to the reductions in risk with uh, systolic, blood pressure, systolic blood pressure reduction in mortality. So this is more than a 50% reduction in risk. So a sizable reduction compared to the 30% that we saw in the previous 
slide for every reduction in risk for every 10 millimeter reduction in systolic blood pressure. So what about cancer? Uh, the expert panel reviewing the data for the US fiscal activity guidelines concluded that fiscal activity is related to reduced risk of many different cancers. So we think of, when we think of cancer, cancer is not a single disease because you can classify cancer according to the cell type that originated the cancer or according to uh, the body site that we name the cancers after. And this expert panel said that there are seven different sites from which there are clear data showing that physical activity reduces risk. There are colon, breast, endometrial, bladder, kidney, um, stomach cancer, and gastric adenocarcinoma. So I'm going to show you data from, again, a pooling project that a group of colleagues and I conducted and we published this last year. This was led by Chuck Matthews and the data came from basically the same pool that I showed you earlier, looking at physical activity and reduced risk of all-cause mortality. By this time, we expanded it to three more cohorts, so there are nine cohorts with more than three quarters of a million individuals. And I don't expect you to see the data um, clearly because you know these are very small panels, but essentially look at the blue part of the chart. The blue part of the chart is the range of physical activity that is currently recommended. And for all of these cancer sites, you see the same thing. You know, if you do some, you're better off than doing none. You see substantial reductions within the risk, within the blue area, which is the range of physical activity that is recommended. So the lines for these different cancers, you know, slope at different rates but within the blue area, and I'm going to show you the next slide as well, which is the other three sites, you see reductions in risk of cancer incidence. Now, for some of these cancers, the reductions are larger. For some of the more ca common cancers, the reductions are not as large. They're more within the range of 15 to 20% reduction in risk. Again, not different from the systolic blood pressure example that I showed you. So I wanted to talk a little also about diabetes because diabetes greatly increases our risk of developing cardiovascular disease. And also because there is a large increase in numbers of people developing diabetes, not just in the US, but in particularly low and middle income countries. And in fact, the rates of increase in the incidence of diabetes is far greater in the low and middle income countries than in the high income countries. So these are data from a clinical trial, a landmark clinical trial published in the early 2000s. It's called the Diabetes Prevention Program Trial. And what this study did was they enrolled, it was a multi-center trial, they enrolled more than 3,000 individuals who had high risk of developing diabetes because they had impaired glucose tolerance. And they randomized these participants to three different arms. So control arm, they took placebo, control arm, were, had usual care, uh, the usual, you have access to clinicians who talk to you about uh, what you might be doing for, uh, what you might be doing in your pre-diabetic state to try and reduce your risk of getting diabetes. And they had a sugar pill, a placebo. One arm was randomized to metformin, which is a diabetes a drug that we use for treating diabetes. And the third arm was randomized to lifestyle, was a lifestyle strategy. So it was not specific to physical activity, but it basically was a lifestyle strategy that was designed to reduce your weight by seven, your weight by 7% and encouraging you to get 150 minutes of moderate intensity physical activity. So when the trial ended, the average fallout at this period of time was just under three years. And what you can see is the rates of development of diabetes in the three groups. Placebo developed diabetes at the highest rate. In the metformin group, you had a 31% reduction in risk, but the lifestyle group had even larger reduction in risk, a 58% reduction in risk. So does this last? This is a follow-up study after a 15-year average follow-up in the DPP group. So you can see that the separation continues to exist between the intervention arms, although the lifestyle and the metformin groups now 
they come closer together. The placebo group is still the worst off. And then the metformin and lifestyle groups, the metformin group over this 15 year period had an 18% reduction in risk of developing diabetes. The lifestyle group still over this 15 year period had a larger reduction, a 27% reduction in risk. The last condition I wanted to talk about before we move on is cognitive health. Now, you know that we're all very worried about dementia and decline in cognitive health, not just in high income countries, but also in middle and low income countries. And in fact, the World Health Organization has stated that dementia is the greatest challenge to global health and social care, because so many people worldwide are increasingly developing dementia. Now, in a review of the literature, the World Health Organization concluded that among adults with normal cognitive function, there are clear data showing that physical activity can reduce the risk of cognitive decline. Among those that already had cognitive decline, the data are not as clear that it can stop the decline. But at least among those of us who are cognitively intact, physical activity is recommended to reduce the risk of cognitive decline. Many of you probably saw the study that came out of Harvard recently. So Bruce Spiegelman's lab several years ago identified a hormone which they called iris and named after the Greek god iris. And this hormone is produced by humans and rodents after exercise. So this is a very exciting study that was published maybe a couple of months ago as a follow-up by Christine Wren's lab. And what they discovered by doing several experiments in knockout mice that are incapable of producing the protein precursor to irisin. What they found out is that irisin can cross the blood brain barrier. And in these knockout mice, when they administered an adenovirus associated vector producing irisin, they found that irisin crosses the blood brain barrier, it protects against neural inflammation in the brain, and it was able to help these mice perform better and even though they perform better and even though this experiment is conducted in mice, I think it is a promising experiment possibly showing us how one of the mechanisms through which physical activity might reduce the risk of cognitive decline and dementia in humans. So we've talked a lot about physical activity and how it benefits health. But as I said, those of us working in the physical activity field with a little bit of a chip on our shoulder about how it's not perceived that seriously. So about 10 years ago, a group of international collaborators and I decided that we would approach the Lancet. The Lancet is a major medical journal based in England. We would approach the Lancet prior to the 2012 games to see whether they would be interested in publishing a series of articles showing how important physical activity is for health. And I show the cover of the inaugural Lines of Physical Activity series in 2012, again, as a, now the tip of the cap to Jack, because I know he served as stint as chairman of the board of trustees for the Museum of Fine Arts. What we did was we picked for our cover, this uh, painting that is by Peter Bruegel, the elder. It is in a museum in, Vienna, and he painted this in 1650. And those of people who studied you know, this painting counted actually 230 children on this slide, apparently playing 83 different games. Now, maybe if Peter Bruegel were to paint this nowadays, this is what we might see. And you might say, oh, where are the children? You know, is it because people have fewer children nowadays? And we would say, no, the children are still there. See these little blue lights inside? The children are now no longer outside. They're all inside on their tablets and on their uh, smartphones or you know, whatever screen device they use. They don't play outside as much as they used to. So what we tried to do was we tried to show how important physical activity is for health. And we calculated that each year, if you were to make everybody who is inactive reach the level of physical activity recommendations, you would decrease the number of deaths worldwide by 5 million. And this particular article that we had, we wanted it 
not just for researchers, not just for people to understand how important it was, but also for governments to see that if you remove fiscal inactivity from the world, you can reduce the number of deaths worldwide by 5 million. And this is equivalent to the number of deaths caused each year by smoking. So physical inactivity is a risk factor worldwide on par with that of smoking. Now let's move on to physical activity guidelines. In the last few minutes, I've kept talking about you know, physical activity guidelines. What are physical activity guidelines? Now, over the years, physical activity guidelines have changed with time. Interestingly, we didn't really have federal physical activity guidelines in the US until 2008. Now guidelines worldwide have been packed pretty much to the timeline that we have in, in the US. The earliest, I would say, guidelines that we had in the US were not actually physical activity guidelines. They were guidelines that were put up by professional organizations such as the American College of Sports Medicine. At that time, the interest really was on performance. How could one become physically fit? And you might imagine that in order be, to become physically fit, and these were experiments primarily conducted in young, healthy men, you would need vigorous exercise to get these young men who are pretty fit to become more fit. Now, over time, when we started having data from epidemiologic studies, such as the ones that my mentor, physical, my mentor Ron Parfenbarga, conducted, we began to realize that you, know, you don't really need to do vigorous exercise. You can do moderate exercise such as walking and it also benefits your health. Now in those days, as I said, the studies primarily relied on self-reported physical activity. So self-reported physical activity, you can't really ask people about bouts of physical activity. So the data that we had at that time tended to be from studies where you looked at chunks of physical activity at the time. Now, with the advent of devices where you can use devices to look at people's physical activity, we can start looking at activity in smaller bouts. And our most recent physical activity recommendations, federal physical rec activity recommendations, that is, that were released in 2018, now removes that bout and it says that, you know, you can chunk, you don't need to do your bouts of physical activity in certain chunks. Any activity is better than none. And we'll talk in the next part about physical activity research that is ongoing that perhaps can look at physical activity at lower intensities, look at sitting, maybe quantify those. So currently, what we have as physical activity recommendations are, and I focus on adults in the interest of time. First, we say move more, sit less. As you can see from the charts that I showed you, any physical activity is better than none. And ideally, what we want you to do is hone in on a level of physical activity that is 150 minutes to 300 minutes of moderate intensity physical activity, such as brisk walking. Or if you want to do vigorous intensity physical activity, then you get double credit. 75 minutes to 150 minutes a week of vigorous intensity physical activity, such as jogging, or any combination of the two that expends equivalent amount of en energy expanded. So on top of that, we also want you to do muscle strengthening activities that will enhance your muscle build up and help you with your physical function. So these are current recommendations for physical activity. And when these recommendations were released in 2018, it relied largely on self-reported physical activity because device-based studies uh, well, while they've been ongoing, I would say for a few years, the data had yet to reach maturity. But since then, we are starting to see a lot of data come up from device-based physical activity. And in our case vignette, we talked about BE, who now has a wearable and you know she can use a wearable to detect her steps. So many people use steps to monitor their physical activity. How much, how many steps do you need for health? Now, if you have a Fitbit and you look at your Fitbit goal, you'll see that the goal for your Fitbit is 10,000 steps. So why 10,000 steps? And the story behind this is that those of you who work in the Brigham will remember that several years ago, the Brigham had sort of like a campaign or a 
health promotion program where they had teams form in different departments to compete with each other to rack up their steps. So I work in the division of preventive medicine and we had to form a team. So my administrator, Harriet Samuelson said, you work on physical activity, here, form a team. And so I was given a Fitbit and told to form a team. And I started, and some of the people in our team were like regular folks who don't get that much physical activity. And I started asking myself the question, why 10,000 steps? You know, who did this research? And I found out that very interestingly, the origin of 10,000 steps was not something that was scientifically based. The first people to come up with 10,000 steps were a Japanese company. So they sold pedometers. So in the 1960s, a Japanese company called the Yamasa Clock and Instrument Company sold a pedometer, which they called the Manpo K, which in Japanese means 10,000 step meter. So that really was the origin of the 10,000 steps, and it sort of got booked into the world. So 10,000 steps will get you to health, but many older people don't take 10,000 steps. So the average postmenopausal woman actually takes about four to 5,000 steps a day. If you bring her in and watch her walk on a treadmill, to meet physical activity recommendations, she would probably take an extra 16,000 plus steps per week. Now let's assume that she does this evenly through the week. So you divide that by seven, that would give her an extra you know, 2000 plus steps. So if you take an average of say 5,000 steps a day, which is what an average postmenopausal woman would do, you add that 20, that 2000 steps on top of 5,000, she would probably meet recommendations by doing 7,000 steps a day and she really doesn't need to do 10,000 steps. So we actually looked at this in our women's health study where we have a cohort of about 17,000 plus women who wear research great Fitbit, if you will. And we monitored their steps and followed them up for mortality. And what we found out that was, what we found out from these women was, okay, again, some is better, more is better than some. And at least for mortality, you see that their mortality rates plateau at a low point at 7,500 steps. So great, if you do 10,000 steps, you actually don't have low mortality rates than a woman who does 7,500 steps. Now, of course, we know that mortality is not everything, right? So there are other outcomes, heart disease, cancer, quality of life, falling, you know, do we see that as well? We are currently looking at that in our women's health study. But I suppose my point is that you know, you don't need 10,000 steps. Some is more and more is better than some. But encouragingly, if you reach like, you know, 7,000, 7,500 steps, you really do see significant amount of benefit. So I have a few more minutes left. And the last chunk of time, what I'm going to talk about is, unfortunately, what most people in the US and probably worldwide ask, how little can I do and get away with it? So. Our current recommendations emphasize and tell you, you know, how many minutes per week, and they refer to moderate or vigorous intensive physical activity. So moderate intensive physical activities will be things like brisk walking, gardening, playing with your kids, walking your dog. Vigorous intensive physical activity will be things like jogging, lap swimming, uh, playing tennis. So what about light intensive physical activity, which older women are more likely to do. And light intensive physical activity will be things like, you know, cleaning up in your house, picking up, doing laundry, washing the dishes. Now, what about sedentary behavior, which we're becoming increasingly interested in? So sedentary behavior is, or sitting is not the flip side of activity. You can be both very sedentary and very active, which many white collar workers are. So we sit a lot at our job, but after work, we might go for a jog or we might take a hike during the weekend. So you can be both sedentary and physically active. And right now you can see that our recommendations say move more, sit less, but they don't actually quantify it because we don't really know what the quantity should be. But ongoing research will tell us more about this because we are now beginning to see lots of devices for these are in commercial use. So you know we have these bands and some of you may also know about the Pura ring. You can actually have a ring that you can wear that will tell you how active you have been. And our research studies use research grade wearables like this. The data produced are 
these. So they give you accelerations. So continuous bouts of accelerations over time. And you can see there are three colors, green, red, and blue, which monitors your accelerations up and down, side to side, and front to back. And you can uh, wear the device on your hip. You can wear the device on your wrist. And you can collect these data. So these data hopefully will inform our future recommendations. And I'm very quickly going to go through a couple of slides. So earlier on, I showed you data on moderate to vigorous intensity physical activity in relation to mortality. So the same meta-analysis also looked at light intensity physical activity. And you can see that it follows the sum is good, more is better than sum, and the benefits plateau at a point in time. The sedentary behavior, so the more you sit, the worse off you are, and it really starts to take off after about nine hours of sitting a day. So we're really interested in this because most people do a little, at least in terms of time, moderate to vigorous intensity physical activity, but a lot of light intensity physical activity. So very quickly, these are data from a study called the Epic Norfolk study. And I did say that cancer is not a single disease, but as I said, the studies that use devices have yet to reach maturity, and most of these studies don't have enough cases to look at any individual cancer at a single point in time. So I'm going to show you moderate to vigorous intensity physical activity on the left-hand side. And you see the usual you know, L-shaped curve with little data at the end. And in the bottom, these gray peaks you see are the number of people that do moderate to vigorous intensity physical activity. And you can see that a lot of people do none. Some people do some, but it peaks, uh, it tails up at this point. Whereas light intensity physical activity follows more our bell-shaped curve. You know, some people do a little, a lot of people do a middling amount and then tapers off. So this is a more normal distribution and it takes place in terms of hours per day, not the minutes per day that we see for moderate intensity moderate to vigorous intensity physical activity. And the data are promising, at least from this one study, you know, even light intensity physical activity seems to be associated with lower cancer incidence. So we would like to see that data accumulated before we make recommendations related to light intensity physical activity. So let's go back to BE. What do you tell her about physical activity? And I hope that what I've shown you over the last period of time will convince you that it's entirely reasonable to tell her physical activity has many benefits. As a first goal, move more, sit less. Any physical activity is better than none. And she should aim for 150 minutes a week of moderate intensity physical activity, such as brisk walking for 30 minutes a day, five days a week. If she's using a wearable, aim for 7,000 steps a day. We didn't have time to get into muscle strengthening activity data, but muscle strengthening activity should also be done for two days a week to build her muscle and bone strength. So the take home points I hope you will get from today's talk is that physical activity is enormously beneficial for health. Talk to your patients about physical activity. This is something I think that is not built into many electronic health records. Right. Kaiser Permanente, for example, they have a program that they call exercise is medicine and actually shows up when a patient comes in, you know, as you would ask about your, as you measure your height, your weight, as you ask about smoking, you also have to ask the patient about physical activity. So what is this person currently doing? What should their goal be? How can she or he achieve their goals? There are many helpful sites available on the web. Here is one of them from the Department of Health and Human Services. And People often ask me, you know, what should I be doing? And I always say that the best activity is one that you will, that you like because this is one that you will continue. If I were to recommend an activity that you don't like, you're not going to continue doing it. So I think you should explore and try new different uh, new activities, maybe some that you've never even heard of. So uh, the last word I'm going to give to a woman called Chandra Toma, and my last tip of the cap to Jack, because Chandra Toma is from India. Some of you may have read about her. She was she made international news, I think, early of, uh, like sometime in March this year. She's a woman who lives in Uttar Pradesh and in a very conservative village. 
and she didn't pick up a pistol and she, she was 68 years old and she found out that she's very good at shooting but the men in her village really didn't want her to do that her male relatives didn't want her to do that so she used to pretend that she was accompanying her granddaughter to these shooting competitions but she herself look at this these were all the medals that she amassed and when the reporter caught up with her the reporter found out that she didn't wear glasses and Miss Toma touched her toes to show the reporter how agile she was at age 89. And so the reporter wanted to know, what's the secret to your strength and agility? And she said, all the household chores I used to do from a young age, like grinding wheat by hand, milking the cows, cutting grass, it's important to stay active. Your body might grow old, but keep your mind sharp. So I'm just going to end very quickly. Just as Jack said, he was very blessed to have good health energy and happiness. I know I've been very blessed to indulge my research to physical activity. And I know that it would have been impossible for me to be able to do this without the help of so many colleagues, too many to name, both staff and investigators. So I'm just going to show you the photographs. I started off with the Harvard Alumni Health Study, and I do have to mention Professor Ralph Poffenbarger by name because he was the one who brought me into this field when I did not want to do it, and I did not appreciate physical activity, but he convinced me otherwise. These are my colleagues from the Women's Health Study, and I especially would like to acknowledge Dr. Julie Burring, who started the Women's Health Study and who has been so generous with her advice and her support through these years. And finally, my Lancet Physical Activity Series collaborators. Uh, Mary talked about her travels to many different countries, and I would say that one of the best parts about these the series of collaborations is international meetings at wonderful places. And this photograph was actually taken in Rio de Janeiro. So I'm going to stop now and stop sharing my screen and give it back to Peter. Thank you, everyone, for listening to me. Well, thank you, I'm in for a really enjoyable and remarkable and, and data rich presentation. Um, unfortunately, because of the structure of our um, series today and starting later in the day, we don't have time to take questions, but Dr. Lee is generously offered to answer any questions you might have by email. Her email address is going to be posted in the chat box momentarily. And also, uh, one more final and heartfelt thank you to Mary Cornell for her support for this same lecture in honor and memory of Jack Kogan. Uh, through this annual event, may we continue to remember him and all the ways he's inspired and touched so many lives. And then finally, just a few quick closing announcements. Um, I hope that some of you will join us, if not all of you, for our Grand Rounds next month on November, November 2nd. It's gonna be another exciting lecture. This one's gonna be entitled, Using an Integrative Approach to Treating COVID-19 Long Haulers, very important issue these days. And that's gonna be presented by Dr. Zina L. Chamali. Um, and this is gonna take place at a regular time on, at 8 a.m. on Tuesday, first Tuesday of the month. I also wanted to remind you that the OSHA Pilot Research Grant Program is still open to receiving letters of intent. Um, that's gonna happen through December. You can learn more about this and other OSHA programs. You can view archive grand rounds, including the one that happened today, and even make a, a philanthropic donation to support our OSHA Center at our website, oshacenter.org. So thank you again for joining us today. Thank you, um, Mary, for your generosity. Thank you, I'm in. Um, and thank you all for in, um, participating in this event. And, and thank you to Jane as well. <laughs>